Good morning. I'm glad you're able to take a moment to uh, direct your hearts and minds to God as we gather for worship, even if it is a virtual gathering. And I have uh, no announcements this day other than I hope that you continue to uh, stay safe and uh, pray for the church and for all of us as we go through these days together. The reading this day is a short one. It comes from the book of James, the fourth chapter, the fourth, fourth verse. We read, Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Next week, we will begin looking at a series of books in the Old Testament laying out how Israel goes through one of the hardest times it ever faces and the history of that and how that helps us today and I'm looking forward to that but today uh, we're, we're in between we've just finished a sermon series on the Lord's Prayer and we're we, have, we haven't begun what's next and so I find it to be a, a good thing to take these moments to check in with John check in with John Wesley that is John Wesley Wesley is the one who began the United Methodist Church. He didn't set out to do that. He set out, he was, began by preaching to people who would listen wherever they were, and then whoever listened, he would invite to gather weekly in groups of eight or so to uh, gather and to hold each other accountable and to follow Jesus together. And so if you ever want to know what the United Methodist Church believes, what is our official like statement of faith, well, well we would say something like, start reading the Bible. Bible, and then you probably want to read the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed. And then what comes next after that is read the sermons of John Wesley and sing the hymns of Charles Wesley. We sing the, the hymns of Charles Wesley often, and then on occasion, I, I, I find it good, I need to go back to the sermons of John and see how does he articulate the faith? How does he describe following Jesus faithfully? And, and so that's what I, I tend to do go between sermon series. Go back to John and take a look at some sermons. And so I did it again. I started looking through the sermons of John Wesley. And uh, I came to a sermon written late in Wesley's life, sermon number 80, if you want to look it up. Uh, this is um, a sermon that he preached when he was actually in his 80s. John Wesley was born in 1703, was preaching by the time he was in his 20s, and was still preaching until just before his death at, at age 88. And so this is something he wrote late in his life, and he uh, preached from this, this part, chunk of the Bible, this single verse in James 4, saying, Adulterers, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Well, Wesley was, was worried that he had seen a slow fade over the decades of people that were formerly deeply committed Christians becoming, over time, less so. And what he is seeing uh, as the cause of this is that people are becoming friends with the world, as, as described in James. Friends with people who have no desire to follow Jesus. And so what Wesley adv Wesley's advice is is in this sermon is to seek the well-being of your neighbor talk to them with regards to any business that you must do but then stop do not seek to have any further interaction with them be courteous do what you can to assist but be aware that if you get too close to them over time their lack of diligence towards following Jesus, their lack of caring about following Jesus at all, will infect you. That's actually the, the, the image he uses. They are just beginning to understand the concept of infections like we do today back in, in the 18th century, century in Wesley's day. And so he talks about how this is uh, the, the malaise, the lackadaisical nature will, will begin to inf infect you. That the lack of concern for God's desire, the care for what the world values, will change you as the person hanging out with, with people who do not follow Jesus. 
In being close to those who do not follow Jesus, he points out, we become acclimated to sin, getting used to it, not being bothered by it, so that first we, we slide into the sins of omission, not doing what we need to be doing, not attending to our own prayers, our own study of scripture, fasting, and then after that we further slide into the sins of commission, doing the things that we ought not do. Wesley identifies the consequences of this as dire. He describes Christians giving in to pride, believing themselves to be self-sufficient, lapsing into self-indulgent lifestyles. And so he warns, whatever you do, do not become friends with the world. That was not what I expected to read in one of the sermons of Wesley. I was reading through these sermons and, and uh, earlier sermons from earlier in his life. The vivacity, the going out and going to, to people uh, had changed by the time he was in his early 80s, 82, 83 years old. And so I read that and I thought, wow, that's, what is that? What do I make of that? Uh, and so I kept on reading because uh, I wanted to see, is this a... Uh, a fluke or is this something that, that he com comes to multiple times and uh, he does come to this idea multiple times wesley published his sermons in sets in like volumes and so the next volume begins with uh, sermon 81 if you do wesley's sermon 81 and he, in it he preaches on second corinthians 6 17 to 18 which reads therefore come out from them be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch nothing unclean, then I will welcome you, and I will be your father, and you shall be my sons and daughters. And Wesley makes a very similar argument. This is evidently a very significant concern for him in his uh, latter years. Wesley argues that this calling for disciples of Jesus to keep their distance from all ungodly people is something we need to, to keep. Do whatever business we have with people, but no more. Do not pick ungodly people to be our regular companions. It will not cause immediate consequence, but little by little, a person's zeal for God will be dimmed and dampened. Whenever another person is cool towards following Jesus, our own heat, our own vigor will, will become lukewarm and then fade, and our confidence will fade. And that, that leads to vanity and pride, levity and dissipation. That in this case, the godless person is not going to see a problem with the faithful one becoming diminished. And the faithful person will cease to look towards the, the kingdom to come and instead worry about the affairs of the world above all else. Well, after reading those two sermons, I put the book down and I thought, well, I need to think about this. I don't, this is not what I expected to be preaching on. I was think, looking for something a little bit more uplifting when it comes to the sermons of Wesley. And I usually find something for, more uplifting. Not so this time. But I needed to take a moment to respond, because when I disagree with someone I respect, John Wesley began the church that I serve in, uh, it, out of that respect, it means taking the time to, to respond and, and, and chew on and think through the argument they make. So, let's do that for a moment. John Wesley was writing in the 1780s when he writes these two sermons. When he was in his 80s, he was born in 1703. And he says when he get hits, when he said when he got to his 80th birthday that he still felt that he had the vigor of being 40. He, he still uh, was riding and, and traveling and seeing and preaching. So he, he understood himself to be just as vigorous at 80 as he was at 40. Uh, <clears throat> But there definitely was a change. The John Wesley, who was 30 or 40, was a younger man traveling all over the island of Britain, preaching multiple times a day to whomever he could gather together. Right? The, the John Wesley of his 30s and 40s was building his first building, his pre, the preaching building, gathering people to join bands, 
trying to find enough people to lead these bands. Right? He had an organization that was growing and it was just a, a challenging moment where it's exciting and things are moving and you got to find new people and you're always on the road. And this is the time when John Wesley talks about becoming more vile because he's got to do what he doesn't want to do, but he's got to do it so that he can reach more people. So he consented to be more vile. He would preach on the side of the road. He would just do whatever it, it took. Right? He was running this very ragtag organization. Well, things had changed by the time John Wesley was in his 80s. By the time John Wesley was in his 80s, in the 1780s, Methodism had become respectable. All this clean living had led to Methodism moving from being predominantly blue collar to more and more white collar. In the beginning of Wesley's ministry, as he would gather these bands together, the challenge was that every person who came to the band meeting every week or the small group meeting was asked to bring a, a penny so that uh, you, money was gathered to help people in need. And, and then whoever led the group was on the hook. If you had eight people gathered, the leader uh, had to be able to hand over eight pennies. And if they, the, one of the people didn't have their penny, the leader was on the hook for that penny. And so it was, this is a challenging thing at the beginning, but by the 1780s, that has no longer become the case. No more is Wesley preaching about giving, like to the giving, saving and, and learn, earning and giving in the same way. Later in his life, in his 80s, uh, John Wesley had three rules about money. He said, make all you can, save all you can, and give all you can. And so later in life, the, what the, Wes, the, the sermons of Wesley shifted as he started to point out to people, you're doing really good on one and two. You're making money and you're saving money. Can you do a little bit more about the giving of the money, right? Again, that's part of the shift in the nature of the Methodist church, right? No longer were they struggling over pennies. But by the time of Wesley in his 80s, no longer was Wesley leading a ragtag reform movement of the Church of England, people who were trying to rise up and get the Church of England to light on fire, to get lit on fire by the Holy Spirit moving in their lives. In his 80s, Wesley was now leading something that was about to become its own church. All right? And so things had changed. With all that in mind, I have a feeling that if the 30-year-old John Wesley had read what the 80-year-old John Wesley had written, that they would have had quite the disagreement. And yet this is where 80-year-old Wesley lands. And where he lands, this idea of separating from the rest of society, keeping yourself distance, doing only as much business as you have to do and then pulling apart, that seems to be a temptation that many churches grapple with. Withdraw from the world, limit interaction. I was talking to another uh, friend of mine about this, another Methodist pastor, because, you know, when you're about to disagree with the guy who founded your church, you want to make sure that you have a leg to stand on. And so I was talking to my friend about this, and he said, yeah, that's exactly what we, we talked about in seminary. Uh, seminary. He, go, he went to a seminary in Texas, and there was a church called Prestonwood that does, did exactly what John Wesley is talking about. Prestonwood is a church that has turned, in, it sounds like, into its own town. My friend told me about it, so I went and looked it up. Prestonwood has its own K-12 through school, has its own football stadium, volleyball setup, soccer fields, all the sports, so you never have to play with anyone but your, the people in your own uh, building, your own way of life, right? Uh, that they, Prestonwood has its own cafe, library, bookstore, fitness center. And, and so the thousands of people that gather at Prestonwood every Sunday, they can interact with the people of their church and that that's it. Like that's, I mean, if throw in their own dry cleaner in a grocery store, and like, what else do you need? Right? This seems to be the logical end for what the 80-year-old John Wesley was proposing. And I admit that there is a certain appeal to this. It would be simple to be that enfolded and wrapped up in, in a community where everyone is following Jesus. It would be, uh, it, it would be convenient, right? It would be good. There's, right? There's an appeal to that. 
I was thinking about this, uh, I was thinking about this in the context of a conflict I found myself in a while ago. I found myself in the middle of a conflict in a community that I am part of. It's not a community here in Shelbina uh, or anything local. Um, it, it was a conflict like happens in any community. There was miscommunication and, and people got sideways with each other. And uh, in this community, I am one of the only Christians. There, there are only a few of us. And um, very niche, niche community, but I'm in a distinct minority. And so uh, my instinct in the middle of conflict is to seek reconciliation, to take time to listen to each other, to be patiently wait and, and figure out what went sideways and resolve the problem. Right? I distinctly remember as I was in the middle of, of, of this uh, conflict, as I'm, I'm trying to figure out like what's my stance, how do I respond, right? I distinctly remember reading the end of Paul's letter to the church at Galatia. In Paul's letter to the church at Galatia, he ends by calling the, the church to live creatively. For if someone falls into sin, we're going to need to restore them, saving our critical comments to our, for ourselves, because we might need be in need of forgiveness ourselves before the day is out, to stoop down and reach out to those who are oppressed to share their burdens. Right? And, and it's fascinating to me that Paul, at the end of his letter to Galatia, writes this. Because right? this, this is the Paul who is as angry as we ever find him. The letter to the church of Galatia, Paul gets hot. Like he is arguing with these other followers of Jesus about the central aspect of, of the gospel. Are we bound by law or is grace what we are under? Right? How does this work? And at the end of this massive argument he is having with some of the people in the church, he still comes back to, we must find ways to creatively work through our differences, to work together, to follow Jesus together. We must be reconciled. And we have to do so gracefully for by the end of the day we might be the ones who need to be reconciled and, and it struck me that this is this is it like this is a confirmation of, of my instinct when it comes to conflict I'm in the middle of this conflict and I'm reading this moment that Paul is having that even when he is angry he's coming back and saying we have to be reconciled and, and and so I'm working in the middle of this community that I'm connected to in the middle of this conflict and I'm trying to help bring reconciliation in. It just flat doesn't work. It just didn't work out. There was no creative solution found. A person was shunned and left. And I was really bothered by it at the time and I still actually am bothered by it today because it was not enjoyable. I kept on reading Galatians. I remember finishing up reading Galatians. I started reading the next chapter in the book, uh, Ephesians, right? That's the next letter. And in Ephesians, uh, I found something that helped me understand how to make sense of uh, what had just happened in this community as part of, and also make sense of how I'm going to respond to John Wesley. Right, this is my response. I'm, I'm disagreeing with John Wesley, but here's how I'm doing it, and I'm doing it rooted in what Paul is writing in Ephesians. He writes, the church you see, Paul, this is Paul, Paul's writing to the church at, at Ephesus. He says, the church you see is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. Now, hear that again, right? The church is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church. Right? The church is at the center. He, he, he continues writing, The church is Christ's body in which Jesus speaks and acts, by which he fulfills everything with his presence. As Paul begins in his letter to the church at Ephesus, he wants them to be reminded of what they are doing as they gather for worship. They are gathering around Jesus, and this is the center. This is what matters most. Everything else is not the center. Everything else is peripheral. Everything else is out there. Everything else is not what is at the center. What is at the center is following Jesus together. Reading that becomes my answer to Wesley. As John Wesley argues that we should cut ourselves off and only do the business that is necessary, 
I say, no, I think we have a better way. The way that I find is to, is not to say that we, with, we by following Jesus, we, with, we withdraw from any unnecessary conflict with people who don't follow Jesus. What I do think is, is needed is, is that as a follower of Jesus, we are called to be centered and rooted in our relationships with other Christians. Right? As Paul puts it, the church is not peripheral to the world. The world is peripheral to the church, right? So as we understand the world, the church is at the center of it, and our lives must be rooted in our relationships to other Christians as our primary relationships, right? That is where our centering and rooting takes place. And then when that is in good shape, when that is strong, then I can be involved out in the world in a way that is going to work out. Right? I'm in the middle of this conflict, I, I keep on going back to, I called a friend, a, a friend of mine who follows Jesus, and I talked to that person about what was happening, and I received some advice, and I lamented how it had gone, and, and uh, just talking to this other person who has the same sense of, of, of what it means to follow Jesus, that we follow Jesus together, it re-established and reaffirmed for me that even though my attempt to act towards reconciliation had not worked out, and even though like, there's some details I can learn about how better to serve, uh, humility, patience, like there are always techniques to work on, right? But the overall drive that I'd work towards reconciliation, that that was profoundly good. And that was, that was, that had been the thing to do. And I got to tell you, I needed to hear that, right? That, that's something I needed to hear. Right? To, to think through the two extremes that can happen, if we're following the guidance of the elder Wesley, right, to, to think of, of, of what basically I'm disagreeing with, but to think of the, the two extremes that could, could happen. One extreme is that if, if we cut ourselves off from anyone who doesn't act, who's not following Jesus, then, okay, fine, it's comfortable for us, but it's pretty hard to love our neighbor if we don't have anything to do with our neighbor. And, and so I, I don't think that works in the long run. I mean, I'm sure Preston Wood has this great school and all the other things they have, but, but I would be intrigued to know, are, are the people of the Pres this Preston Wood Church, are they involved in making a difference in the lives of their neighbors around them, or are they turned inwards, and, and that's just who, what they're doing, right? So that's one extreme, um, and I think that is unfortunate. I don't think that's where we are called to be. And, and I think the other extreme it carries a different risk. The other extreme is to be so involved out there, so involved in all the other things, that we lose our sense of being rooted and following Jesus with others, right? That it becomes hard to love our neighbor. We, might, we'll know, we know exactly who our neighbors are because we're with them all the time, right? And we can be with our neighbors all the time, but if we aren't rooted here in following Jesus together, it's hard to love our neighbors if we're not being loved ourselves, right? If we're not receiving if, uh, grace if we're not receiving the good news of Jesus Christ, if we're not rooted in, in this commitment to, to other fellow Christians and in, in, in committed to uh, reconciliation and peacemaking, like if we're not rooted in all of these things, if we go out, we can't offer anything good to our neighbors. Right? So there's this middle path to take to be rooted in the life of the church, to be rooted in being in relationship with other Christians, to be rooted in following Jesus together, so that when we do go out, and we will, right? Not just to be business only, but to be involved, but to be involved in a way so that we have something to offer, something that is tasty and zesty and interesting, right? I, I, this, this is what I think of when uh, Jesus talks about when salt loses its saltiness, what good is it, right? To, to go out and to stay salty. And so this is a balance to negotiate. I believe it is a balance that we need to pay attention to. And it's a balance that we need to ask this question of ourselves. Are, are we, each of us, rooted in following Jesus with others such that the church is the center and the rest of what we do is peripheral? 
Has it been at other points in our lives and maybe is not so much the case now, right? This is a question we need to ask. And I think right now is a good time to ask that question, not just because uh, it's a, uh, that, the nature of that question, but because the nature of this time, because there's so much that is up in the air, there's so much that we aren't doing that we usually would be doing, right? We are cut off from our usual people, our usual gatherings, and you know, this year is just getting a bit old. I'm a about done with 2020. I, I wish 2020 was done with us. And so the question is, are we, do we have that balance? Do we have that sense that we are deeply rooted in the life of following Jesus together, such that when we go out to interact with our neighbors that we are uh, rooted in, in something distinctive? And if that is not the case, what is it time to do about it? We're about to begin this fall. And this fall, I'm inviting the people of the church to look around. And yes, we're in the middle of a pandemic. And so look around and, and ask yourself, can you find one or more people, whether it's a friend, family, whatever, that you would like to meet with weekly for a month, for two months, whatever length of time you want to choose, right? Just pick a time period. Pick a person. You can check them with them on the phone. You can do it in person. You can do it on the front porch. You know, you just work it out. But can you figure out who can you meet with on a regular basis during this season to attend to following Jesus together, to put the church at the center of our lives, to let that be center and everything else be peripheral? And once you've figured out who that's going to be, like I, this is an offer for the members of this church, Albina and Honeywell, or for anyone who's watching this, I make this same offer, right? If you need to, if you can find one or more people who you're willing to meet with on a regular basis, whether it's virtually or in person, whatever is safe for your context, you let me know who that is, and we can work out what it is that this church can prov provide to help you be rooted in Jesus during this time. Whether it's a, a Bible study, we're looking at Disciple Fast Track, a Methodist Bible study, or it's learning about topics. The Methodist Church pr produces these like sort of newsletters on various topics. You, I'll give you a list of topics, you tell me which ones you want to do as a group, and I'll get them all to you, and you tell me how they go, right? Or whether you want to learn about race, there is a podcast called Faith and Race, I believe, uh, that is, I believe that's the title, that was done by the Missouri Conference to look at uh, and listen to black Methodist pastors and, and Christians in, here in Missouri. So it's not, it's not being mediated by anyone else other than just listening to people who are Methodists in our pews, in our churches here in Missouri. And how do we start to think through race in a year when race has become quite the issue? Whatever it is you need, you tell me, and I will help you get it worked out. The essential part, then, is asking that question. What am I doing? To Am I balanced right now? Am I firmly rooted so that church and following Jesus while other Christians is at the center and everything else is peripheral? And if that is not the case, what do I need to do to, to change that? Because we do need it. We need it deeply. Grace to, to you this day and always. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Let us pray. Lord, bless we who gather this day, as well as all who gather in your name, who are choosing to place following you at the center of their lives. As we have made this choice, as we follow, may it so root us in you, in your dreams, in your desires, your hopes and goals, that when we do go out, we do not flounder, we do not stray, but we remain sources of grace in the midst of whatever happens. We give you thanks for the groups of people with whom we gather to follow you together. We pray that we might serve each other. We pray for all these things as we pray for those who lead in our communities. We pray for those who are struggling with COVID-19. We pray for all, all our communities that are struggling to understand and comprehend and cope with the challenges of racial divides and all of the pain that has been inherited with those. We pray for uh, this church, that we might continue to find a way forward, faithfully following you. We pray for all these things as we pray the prayer that you taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. 
Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses. We forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Now may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you this day. Go forth now in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.